Welcome back to our series on the glory of God. I'm glad you're here. We're, we're in a section that is a, a bit surprising, to be honest with you. In the first three of this series, we talked about that you're not surprised that God has his glory in creation and other places. But in Isaiah 42 and Isaiah 48, God says, I don't give my glory to another, and, and, and yet he does. He takes his glory, not a rogue glory, not a counterfeit glory, but his glory like a mantle or a coat, and he puts it on a human being. This one we're going to in this section, and we're going to talk about the second surprising place. He puts it on his church. In Ephesians chapter 3, here's the text that goes like this. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that's at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. We're not surprised, any of us, that the glory of God would, would be on Jesus. But that the glory of God would be on his church, that one seems a little funny. Have you seen my church? Are you sure about that? First Timothy. In First Timothy 3, in chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, here's what he will say there. Paul writes to Timothy and says, although I hope to come to you soon, I'm writing you these instructions so that if I'm delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. It's pretty crazy when you think about it, that God would take a bunch of broken people and that he would put his glory and his wonder in them both individually and then collectively and call it his church, his body. We could fill our entire time just by going through metaphors. There's over 90 metaphors that are used about the assembly of God. It's his body, it's his flock, it's his family, it's his bride, it's his kingdom, it's his temple, and you could just keep going on. And we could stop here and say, yes, but I know really bad stories of how someone treated me or how I treated somebody else. And I know bad stories about the church. And, and I do too. I do too. I've been over 40 years somebody's minister. And I'm confident I'm both the recipient of some of those stories and to my great regret, I'm sure I'm the cause of some of those stories. But every now and then, you have to stop and ask yourself a rather haunting question. If I knew what God thought, would it make any difference to me? Yes. And one of the clearest things, you could even bring an unbeliever in and hand him a Bible and say, I have this question, would you read through and would you tell me what God thinks of his church? And even an unbeliever with his casual reading would come back and say, I cannot believe how highly he thinks of his church. I told you last session, you'll never go wrong loving another human being. And I'll tell you in this one, you'll never go wrong loving the church. This concept of loving the church is, is, is probably going to be built around a couple of things that really surprise us. We read scripture and, and we have trouble grasping some things. They just are a surprise to us. Uh, when you see a, a guy named Uzzah in the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant is being moved and the, and the Ark of the Covenant is on a cart and it rocks and Uzzah just puts his hand out to steady it so it won't fall and God strikes him down dead. King Saul. King Saul is waiting for Samuel, the prophet, to come to offer a, a, an offering. But, but Samuel's delayed by a week. And, Saul, and, and so King Saul's waiting for a week. And, and he goes, okay, I guess I'll offer it. And he offers it. And God takes the kingdom away from King Saul because of that. You, you go through any number of illustrations. Moses, Moses is in the, in, in the, in the wilderness and he's frustrated and he cries out and, about a rock and, and, and he gets angry and he gives water out of a rock as, 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 as in obedience to God, but his anger and his claiming with himself and, 
and Moses can't even enter the promised land. And we go, wait a second, the crime doesn't seem to match the punishment. The reason that it feels that way to us is we don't understand holy. We really don't. We just see a guy putting a hand out. We just see a guy get angry. We just see a guy off. And God says, no, you don't understand holy. And when you understand holy, everything is changed. Everything is different. And the concept about the church is God said, I have made it holy. I declare it holy. If you think about that, that's a pattern that God has used a lot. For example, the tabernacle, we all agree it was holy, except it wasn't before. It was just a bunch of skin sewn together, and it was a bunch of metal hammered out and put. But when God took that and he placed his holiness on it, it made it holy. The temple was just a bunch of stones. They they, they cut them out, and they they hewn them, and they brought the stones, and they put them, and, and they were just rocks until God declares it holy. And the church... Quite frankly, if you were just adding up the sum of its parts, you'd say, well, I don't know that it's all that holy. Except God says, it's holy to me. And you'll you'll treat it as holy. I make it holy. I declare it as holy. R.C. Sprouls is a a teacher that, that many of you may be familiar with, but he tells a story that I think is incredibly important. He said he was speaking at a, at a small church. He said probably 40 people. It was a church that, that probably had had a little disunity somewhere along the line. It was a church that just was a struggling church. R.C. said he stood up to speak, and when he stood up to speak, he, he made a statement to the 40 people there. He said, I always get nervous when I speak at such an auspicious, an auspicious group as this at such an occasion. And the crowd had their laughter. They thought he had a joke. And Darcy said, no. No, you don't understand. I'm not joking. He said, do you know what happens when we assemble? Do you know who the church is? And he opened up and he read Hebrews chapter 12. I want to read a portion of it for you as well. Hebrews chapter 12, starting in the 18th verse. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and is burning with fire. Oh, what? What he's doing in this text is he's taking their memory back to when the children of Israel came out of Egypt and they went to a mountain at their first great assembly before God. And it was Mount Sinai. And they came to a mountain and all kinds of things played out at that mountain. That's what he's going to talk about. But the writer of Hebrews says this, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and is burning with fire. You haven't come to darkness and gloom and storms. You haven't come to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they couldn't bear what was commanded. And even if an animal touched the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I'm trembling with fear. That's what they came to as a mountain. But you haven't come to that mountain. You've come to something more. Verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. When you come together and assemble, you don't just come with the 40 people in this room. You come to the presence of God, and you come to the presence of the angels, and you come to the presence of eternity, and you come to the presence of the Redeemer, and you come to the presence, and he begins to describe the church. You've come in this joyful assembly, it says, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You're not just a bunch of people who happen to attend a service, God's people. You come to a significant place. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. You've come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. He begins to talk about the sacrifice of Christ for these people. Come on down to verse 28 of Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, Let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. 
That whole passage is built around a concept. What do you do in the presence of the holy? In the presence of holy, two things always have to happen. Number one is you have to always remember who God is. And number two, you have to always remember who you are. And he says, in the church and your assembly and the church of the firstborn, this, this assembled group, that's who you are. It's talking about more than just the assembly. I realize that. But do you see the church accurately? Are you taking care of what God has declared to be holy? In 2 Peter and in Jude, there's a statement made about wicked people. It's made about unholy people. It says they speak against glorious things and they don't understand what they speak against and they do so without shame. Whoa, you mean my own speaking about the church could lump me in with the wicked and the unholy because I speak against things that are glorious, but I don't understand and I don't even feel shame. Nobody's arguing that the church is a perfected finished group. Quite frankly, we're a bunch of, of sinners in this process of, of being redeemed. But it's pretty clear that we are to take good care of one another because God has pronounced his church to be holy to him. My wife and I, Julie, we had three children and this would be true of all three, but I wanna pick out the two daughters in particular. When my daughters got married and I, I joke, you, everybody knows you, 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 you take home a little 22 ounce or two, 22 inch child and, and you carry and take this little girl home and you love her and then the joke is you, you walk her down the aisle and hand her to a barbarian. And truth is my daughter's married great men. In fact, I, I admire the kind of men that, that they are. But my daughters, when they married these men, I knew the weaknesses of my daughters. I love them dearly. They're phenomenal women. But I knew what was going to drive Josh crazy about Katie. I, I knew Katie. I, Katie's has an indecisiveness and a brilliance both. They're both there. And I, and I knew about Megan's stubbornness here in this area. I mean, I've known that since they were third grade. You could see these traits that were in them. Wonderful women. And I knew what dr would drive Ryan crazy with Megan or, or Josh crazy with Katie on occasions. But when I handed those girls off to their husbands, I cannot tell you how deeply, and even in spite of their funny little oddities, and we're all odd, we all have our things, it's funny how deeply I wanted them loved. That's really all I wanted. Yeah, I know, I know they stumble on occasions. James chapter three says we all stumble in many ways. I'm sure it was the exact same thing when, when my father-in-law handed Julie off to me. He, he would have known some of the things that Julie might stumble at. But the only thing he really wanted was her deeply loved. Is it possible that the church you're in, you have begun to accumulate all the reasons why you think there's weaknesses in that church and why you're so frustrated and why that's not the rest, best place for you, or maybe that's why you shouldn't treat them. And maybe that's, is it possible that you need to remember Uzzah and Moses and King Saul and Jude? Is it possible there are holy things I just need to always be humble about? There's no doubt there are congregations that lose their way. I know that. There's no doubt that there are congregations that get lost. I know that. I read Revelation where Christ himself says about these seven churches in Revelation. Uh, some of them, you need to be careful. I'm going to come and take away the lampstand, which is the symbolism of, of you as my church. I will take you out of the very holy place you're in. I, I, that's his prerogative, and I get that. But even if we have to make hard decisions about the church, there's certainly a holiness and a sacredness I still must treat it with. Maybe my analogy might work this way. I know that there are marriages that don't do well. I, I know that. But I know that marriage itself is still a high thing. And while this marriage may 
actually need to end because there was such brokenness in that marriage that it was so harmful. I, I, I get that in the affairs and the things. But don't ever lower how you see marriage because the broken thing doesn't take away the thing that it's supposed to be and the thing that it ought to be. And so my appeal is this. Would you make sure that you treat the church as it ought to be treated? There's a passage that's pretty haunting to all of us, I'm assuming. It's 1 Corinthians 3. And in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 and 17, he says this. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst. And if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. Mind your words. Mind your kindness. Mind your attitude. Mind your investment. Mind that you treat holy as holy. Let me finish with this. C.S. Lewis, I'll kind of paraphrase him, but C.S. Lewis, when he became a Christ follower, he began to talk about attending church, and, and he speaks a little tongue-in-cheek, and he's using a little humor, but he said, I wasn't impressed with the music. He said, I kind of thought the, the, the music, for the most part, was sixth-rate music with fifth-rate poetry. He said it, it wasn't that impressive to him. But he said, the more I attended church in this odd menagerie of people, he said, I, I, I re began to realize that the experience at church, even those things that drove me crazy, those songs were being sung with devotion by people who were benefited, the, benefited from it, and those people were a benefit to me. And he began to describe an old saint who sat across the, the row. He said it was an old saint who sat in the pew opposite him with the uh, rubber boots that have the side uh, zipper on them, and he said, I'm looking at that guy and I'm listening as he sings those music, those songs, and as the church service has its clumsiness. And then he said it and I realized I wasn't worthy to even clean that man's boots. God is doing something in the lives of the people within your church that is it possible that the quiet arrogance and forgetfulness I've had about the holiness that God placed on the church has been blocking how I see God's saints within that church. There's this crazy, wonderful paradox of God. I will make that which is unholy. I will declare it to be holy. And someday, someday I will make it in reality to be everything I've declared it to be. May we live faithfully with the church.